Welcome to Discovering. Tonight, we are chasing the Northern Lights, which are predicted to put on some amazing displays in 2024. And I visit some businesses here in the UP that are inspired by the Auroras. One is Beth Milner Jewelry. And I think that people want a little symbol of that, that amazing moment where they saw the sky kind of turn into to something they never imagined before. And Fresh Coast Cabins, who I did a story with a few years ago when they began remodeling their cabins, and I went back to see the near-end result. One of the reasons that we bought this, this particular property is it's the northernmost piece of property in the state of Michigan. So sit back and relax. It's Monday night, and it's time for Upper Michigan's very own Discovering. The secret streams that flow beneath the cliffs of colored stone. Forest thick and healthy with birch and pine and oak. Surrounded by the greatest lakes this world has ever known. The black bear's awesome presence as he roams the hills and fields. Call of the timber wolf. Lonesome trill, the eagle soaring high above, the trout lies deep and still. These are what I treasure, the only way I measure feelings that I have for this fine land. There is so much to discover when you're a long time lover of northern Michigan. One of the many great parts of living in the Upper Peninsula is we are far enough north to see the northern lights. Not as often or as intense as, say, Finland or Alaska, but for the lower 48, we have a prime location. What makes the 906 even better is the dark skies. Even if you live in an urban area, it's not a far drive to find a spot with no light pollution. The Northern Lights, more scientifically called the Aurora Borealis, are one of the seven natural wonders of the world. We call the Northern Lights uh, Aurora Borealis, and that's the northern um, latitudes, what Galileo named the Northern Lights. At the South Pole, they're called Aurora Australis. These dancing lights seem like magic, but they're actually created by the sun. To tell us exactly how this phenomenon occurs, I found an expert. By day, Jason Makala builds rockets for satellites, and by night, you can find him chasing the auroras along the shore of Lake Superior at the Fresh Coast cabins he and his wife Lynn own just south of Copper Harbor. So in theory, uh, they're, they're really kind of straightforward and simple, but in uh, practice, uh, it requires a lot of things to happen simultaneously in order for us to, uh, to view them. So pretty much any, any planet that has a magnetic field and an atmosphere can have northern lights. Our Earth is a lot like a bar magnet that people play with as a kid that has a north and a south pole with kind of C-shaped magnetic field lines that attach the two poles. So what happens is the sun has what scientists call coronal mass ejections. And what that means, those CMEs, they shoot charged particles over to the Earth. And if we're lucky enough, those charged particles will impact the Earth's magnetic field. And for the most part, those charged particles are kind of deflected around the Earth, but where the magnetic field lines connect at the North and the South Pole, it allows charged particles from the sun to kind of leak into the Earth's atmosphere. And that atmosphere has a bunch of different atoms like nitrogen and oxygen floating around. When the sun shoots charged particles over to the Earth, those charged particles inter interact with the atoms that are already here. And when they collide, they release um, energy. And depending on the wavelength of the, the particles that are emitted, that impacts the colors that we see. And in order to see the Northern Lights, not only do we need those charged particles coming from the sun over to us, but we also need clear skies and the minimum uh, light pollution or minimal light pollution. So it's ideal to have clear skies, uh, no moon, and of course, uh, the sun shooting particles over at us. If you've never experienced the Northern Lights, keep an eye on the sky next year, which is just around the corner. 
So the reason that 2024 and 2025 are looking really good for Northern Lights is that the sun has uh, an 11 year cycle that's called the solar max that we're approaching. So every 11 years, the sun has um, this uh, circumstance where the magnetic um, poles flip and it causes a lot of activity um, on the surface of the sun. So um, every 11 years, all of that uh, activity, as it increases, it sends more and more charged particles over uh, out into space in general, but of course over to Earth. And um, that's what causes an increase in the Northern Lights activity every 11 years. On any given night, if you go out chasing the lights, you will probably be disappointed. Thankfully, space weather scientists have the tools to predict when the northern lights will occur. Predicting Earth's weather is hard enough, but predicting space weather is, of course, even more challenging. It typically takes the particles about two to three days to reach Earth from the sun when they're emitted. So our, the first thing that we can do uh, to have an idea of if the northern lights are going to happen is visually observing the sun. You can see the coronal mass ejections shoot out. We have a pretty good uh, ability to predict if they're Earth directed or not. Uh, you know, we're really far away from the sun, so when it shoots out charged particles, we need to be really lucky for them to actually like hit the Earth um, at this distance. And then as those charged particles get closer and closer to Earth, there's actually a couple of satellites up in orbit that have the ability to uh, measure, they have different probes to measure charged particles. So we'll see the, the density of those particles increasing as they get really close to Earth. And that gives us a, a couple hour heads up when the Northern Lights are uh, highly probable. For us Earthlings who are not space engineers, there is an app for that. The app I personally use is called My Aurora Forecast. You can also go online to the NOAA Space and Weather Prediction website where they have a forecast map to show you how likely the northern lights will be. There's also online groups that are great resources. There's the Michigan Aurora Chasers group. That one, they present a lot of really good information and also they distill all of the really technical data down and they provide daily or weekly uh, forecasts for the Aurora. So that's a great resource. The stronger the forecast numbers, the better you will see the northern lights with your naked eyes. I've seen the lights many times, but only through my camera. Cameras have such sensitive sensors in them, and they have the ability to, to process a lot lower light than our human eyes can. Oftentimes on a night where the auroras are predicted to be out, I'll actually go out, before you can even see them with your naked eye, I'll just go out and start taking pictures with my camera, and that kind of is a leading indicator that they are um, coming out and that it's worth staying up late <laughs> to uh, watch for them. One of the other things that cameras um, are notorious for is when you take a picture of the northern lights, the sensors in the cameras, they produce colors that you can't see with your naked eye. So when you see the, the crazy, really bright uh, reds and greens and purples and all of those things, sometimes you can see those colors with your naked eye when there's a really strong aurora storm. But most often they're very grayish and, and very light green. We have so many great places to view the auroras, especially along the Lake Superior shoreline. Find any park or public beach on a strong forecast night, and I'm sure you won't be the only one there. But with a strong solar storm, you don't need a northern view. So when you have a really good storm, like we've seen some amazing aurora activity over the last couple of years where you can look in any direction, east, west, north, south, they're just like dancing across the sky. And I expect that to continue uh, through, you know, 2024 into 2025. So you should be able to see them pretty much from wherever you are in the UP, looking any direction if the conditions are right. But I still recommend driving up to Lake Superior if you can. One of the reasons that we bought this, this particular property is it's the northernmost piece of property in the state of Michigan. And with no obstruction to the northern sky, we just have Lake Superior here, and then there's like 60 or 70 miles of wide open space until you hit Canada. So uh, that was one of the primary reasons we wanted this property. I'm a, I'm a big space nerd, and I love watching the uh, auroras.
Back in the spring of 2021, I heard about Lynn and Jason Makala and the property of cabins they recently purchased and plan to renovate. Cabin 9 was probably in the worst shape of all the cabins here, but it's also, it has a lot of character and it's one of our favorite cabins. While I was here, we took a peek at a couple cabin renovations. When you were here last, I think we were in the process of reorganizing the layout completely. So with bringing the door to this edge, we wanted to, again, kind of make everything focus on the, on the water. What's crazy is this window used to be in the bathroom um, of the original cabin. So this was um, a wall here. So this was the only living area, really. There was this small area, and then up front, there was a, a great table, but we kind of moved every Thing around in order to be able to accommodate the best fireplace that ever happened in the entire world. They're winterized right now, so Lynn sent me some photos to give you an idea of what they look like. Everyone always asks us what our favorite cabin is, and it's always the cabin that we're working on at the moment. Like whatever the one that is currently the project that you're kind of like sitting in it and you're thinking about the space and how people will use it and what they'll want to do when they get there. And doing that in every space is uh, it's one of my favorite things. So when got its own lodge treatment. This actually used to look identical to the one that's up on the hill before the renovation. The scientific reasoning behind why we choose cabins to redo is based on how likely they are for the roofs to leak. So in cabin eight, uh, the newly renovated cabin eight, the bedroom used to be right here where the kitchen is now. Um, the area where the bedroom is now is where you entered and then the bathroom kind of stayed in the same location. Um, one of the things that has always been a part of them is having full kitchens. I think that really works well for people looking to stay for three, four, five nights and, uh, and keep, make it cozy like home. And all of the windows that are in here are from the lodge. You know, save a lot of money, but also they look really great. We're able to do a lot with light and bring in more of the features of the outside with the lofted structure. I we're pretty happy with how this one turned out too. It's definitely the newest cabin, I would say, other than Aurora Major. You wouldn't even recognize the main building. Change it from kind of this barn roof style to a single slope, modern roof. And, uh, we're going a little crazy. We're, yeah, a little crazy. <laughs> we're, we're definitely going to a place that the Keweenaw has not been. <laughs> it's also going to be the coolest spot to see the Northern Lights in the Keweenaw. And the upstairs we seen before is now the Aurora Major Suite. Lynn made tea and we sat down to chat about this major reno. This is the latest addition to Aurora Major. So if you come stay, you can use one of Kenyon Hansen's mugs. Him and his wife, Lindsay, are fabulous. They're potters in... Dollar Bay. It was a pretty big renovation. I mean, it did take us a full year. Flipped off the roof on April 7th of 2021. Can't please remember that date. Yeah, it was a big day. Actually, thanks to 41 Lumber, we had that day because we had roof trust issues. You know, it was right after COVID, things were still supply and delay, and we had a team of, what, 12 people that were going to be here and no trusses for the roof, and that's kind of a big problem when you're going to rip off the roof. <laughs> yeah. yeah, this was one of the most exciting projects. We ripped the entire roof off and the, the entire north wall and then built this side up about six and a half feet. The whole plan was to add as much glass as we could so you could lay in bed and watch the northern lights. Yeah, that was the whole vision for this space. And when we started, when you were here last time, there was only two windows on the entire wall facing the north. And so we clearly went a little overboard, maybe. <laughs> but as much glass as possible and just lets in so much light and just being able to watch the water all the time, sit on the couch, watch the water, do dishes and watch the water. It's pretty much all I want to be doing, whatever I'm doing, is watching the water at the same time. <laughs> Is this, I mean, what you envisioned when you first looked up here and seen what it looked like up here? I mean, oh gosh, no. <laughs> Actually, we were originally planning to tear this building down. When we first started peeling back the layers of the onion, the first couple things we saw didn't look, really look very good. The more we gutted from the building, we were able to dig in a little bit deeper and see that there were some really good bones. Yeah. So then that's when our mind shifted completely. And then we started thinking about this space, what we could do with it and how we could make it a more like magical space that um, would be comfy and cozy. I'm glad we were able to do something with it. it it's had many different lives. It was, mm -hmm. uh, we, Lynn has been collecting a lot of old historic photos and postcards and things that uh, show what this building looked like. And at one point it was a bar and had a door on that side of the building. 
a couple decades later, it became a gas station, and then it was a German restaurant, and then someone's home. And um, it's kind of nice that we we're able to add another chapter to the, the story. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it should be good for a while now. <laughs> <laughs> Except for the downstairs. <laughs> Don't look downstairs. That's still the ongoing renovation. So This is our most popular space. After the renovation stopped, we have been renting this one out nonstop. And, uh, and we are also renting it out this winter. So if anyone wants to come stay, reach out. It is a two bedroom, two king beds up here. We've got a pretty luxurious spa-like shower with bathtub situation. And it's a pretty great place to hang out and cook or read or look at the water like I like to do, or just go explore the on. It definitely looks like the best place to go and watch the Northern Lights. The Northern Lights hit last year and it was just awesome. Everybody was at Presque Isle and I'm texting all my coworkers and studio assistants and we're like, do you see the Northern Lights? And they're like, yes, it's so awesome. So we all really were super excited about that. And it was only a coincidence that literally before that major Northern Lights hit, we were already working on um, some new Northern Light design. So today we're gonna make one of our Northern Lights river pendants. And the first step here is taking our Labradorite stone, which is this beautiful stone that really to us looks like the Northern Lights and we're gonna make a bezel for it. So we're taking a piece of silver and we're gonna wrap that around the stone. So we use fine silver because it's a little bit softer than sterling. So we're gonna go ahead and then cut this piece of metal. And now I've got the ends of that metal together and because it's fine silver, we can actually fuse this material. So we're gonna use the torch and basically melt it to itself, which is pretty cool. I see the metal starting to glow. I'm trying to keep that glow real even between both sides. And you'll almost see the very tip of this shape start to sweat right there. And now it's become one piece of metal with no seam. And we're gonna make a really nice flat back to this because that will make it solder down to our base plate really easily. All right, and so the back of it is sanded and then our next step is soldering this down to a base plate for the back of the pendant. And so I'm gonna light my torch and then I'm gonna spray the flux onto the sterling silver until I get a white coating and that helps prevent getting oxides on the metal that take a lot of sanding to remove. And put our bezel on top of that. We have extra metal here too, just so it's easier to, to work with. And then we're gonna place our solder inside of the bezel. And then we're gonna go ahead and heat this up until that solder flows around the perimeter. So now we have our design that I make on the computer. And actually I should mention my assistant Nina came up with this whole Northern Lights concept. And so we've both been making many of them because uh, people are really, really excited about it. There, now we have the spots where we can thread our saw blade through and do the sawing. So we're tightening the saw blade here. So we've got it through the metal around the design. Recently I've been collaborating a little bit with my team, but I think all of our inspiration comes from living in this area. So it's really a reflection of the beauty of the Upper Peninsula. And I think if you ask anybody who's made roots here or lives here, they live in this place because of the natural beauty and the lake. And I think the Northern Lights are just icing on the cake. I think we don't expect to necessarily see them, but when we do, we feel like it's really special. The main parts that'll be cut away is the sky and the river. So we get a really nice um, showing of the, the Northern Lights kind of in the sky and as a reflection on the water. So next we're gonna do a little sanding to the bezel to get it exactly the right height and a real crisp edge to it. So next I'm gonna put the stone in and check the fit one last time before we set it. So the first tool we have is a bezel pusher, which is just a nice square end. And so this is where making sure everything's clamped real tight. And I'm gonna push pretty hard. So now I've switched here to this brass uh, bezel rocker. I'm very slowly compressing the metal around the curve of the stone. I'm going to switch over to my hammer hand piece, which is going to give me a little mechanical assist here. And then we'll go through polishing steps to get that polished and shiny. And so there's kind of several more finishing steps to get that just perfect. So now we have the finished pendant with the edge nice and sanded and shiny. And you may have noticed the stone has changed a few times through the process because we're doing a little co cooking show style where we've got things prepped in advance. And some of the part you didn't see here is like how we, we texture the back. So that's that same tool I used for hammering down the bezel, the mechanical hammer hand piece. We have lots of little tips and we texture texture around on the grass here. And we use little tiny burrs to carve 
the tree tops and to kind of make a carved line between them to make them really stand out in the design. And what's interesting about Labradorite is as you move it, sometimes it shows its flash and sometimes it doesn't. So it, it really changes based on the angle it's being held, which is fun because it's a little mysterious like the Northern Lights actually are. So we, we feel like the stone really does a good job of, of showing off the Northern Lights. That's all for tonight, and I hope to see you right back here next week for Upper Michigan's very own Discovering. <laughs>